Okay. Amen. Biochemistry this weekend. <laughs> I like that. That's good. So uh, exam coming up on Wednesday. I will schedule a review session. I haven't decided yet when that will be. It will likely be Tuesday night. Um, but I will um, uh, get a room and get that scheduled. But it will likely be sometime Tuesday night. Okay. Um, I have one more thing I want to say about um, the uh, mitochondrion, and then uh, I'll move on. And this is an interesting thing. Again, it's an interesting thing with respect to human um, health. All right. So um, you saw what happened last time, how metabolic control, obviously all these pathways and so forth are interlinked. And you also saw what happened if you disrupt me uh, uh, metabolic control by inserting something like 2,4-DNP that breaks down the proton gradient. And I will remind you that when we did that, and I said we had the magic diet drug, the person really would burn up a lot of things, and they would end up losing weight if they didn't kill themselves. However, um, one of the byproducts of that, I said while they were sleeping, was what? Two, two things. What's going to happen? Heavy breathing and heat. Okay. Well, it turns out that biologically that heat thing turns out to be important. All right? um, our cells use breaking down the proton gradient as a way of generating heat. So we have a natural protein in cells of our body called brown fat that contain a protein called uncoupling protein. And what uncoupling protein does is, just as its name would suggest, is it inserts itself into the mitochondrial inner membrane of the cells of brown fat. And it allows protons to flow through it, bypassing complex 5. And exactly what happened with 2,4-DNP happens in those brown fat cells. They start burning up fat. They start burning up any sugars that they have, and the heat rises. Okay? Well, they don't do it forever, or they would all die, but they do that for a period of time until the heat rises. And when the heat rises, there's a very important reason that brown fat cells do this. Okay? If we look at the location of brown fat cells in our body, and I think I've got a figure that shows that, if we look at the location of brown fat cells in our body, we see that they are disproportionately in areas where we have a lot of nervous tissue. Okay? So one of the things that they do is they help keep important things like nerve cells and other cells warm. So you have a built-in mechanism to do that. And if you think about that, that's really important because nerve cells, in particular, are sensitive to temperature because they are sensitive to the diffusion of those ions through the nerve cells. If you lower the temperature, you will slow the rate of diffusion. And if you slow the rate of diffusion, you slow the rate of transmission of a nerve cell. You can't afford to leave the finger in the flame for too long. You want to have those nerve cells working very quickly. So brown fat is really kind of cool in that sense. All right? The brown fat can be plugged up all right, um, by uh, uh, the uh, fatty acid known as palmitate. Palmitate will plug up those holes and keep the brown fat, uh, keep the, the uncoupling protein from letting more protons in. So the uncoupling protein is, I, I'll back up and say that correctly, the uncoupling protein is plugged by palmitic acid. Pretty cool stuff. Pretty warm stuff, as the case may be. All right. Um, uncoupling protein right there. And you can see exactly, it's called UCP. You can see exactly what it's doing. Right? So it's bypassing this synthesis of ATP. And the cell starts up its citric acid cycle. We'll see it starts up its fatty acid oxidation uh, uh, next week. And uh, the cell is off and running. The proton gradient is not a trivial thing just for making energy. Cells use proton gradient to do a variety of things. I'm not asking you to memorize these or anything. But it just shows you that some of the very useful things that come about from a proton gradient. You've seen the heat production. You've seen the synthesis of ATP. Bacteria can use it, and other cells can use it to move their flagella. Active transport, we've seen how the proton gradient um, allowed cells to bring things in. We saw it with the sodium gradient. 
Similar things happen with a proton gradient if we're talking about the movement of lactose, for example. Electron potential, uh, that actually uh, relates to the uh, uh, nervous transmission and so forth. And also the synthesis of NADPH, which we won't go into here. OK, so that's the last of what I want to say about the mitochondria and the oxidations there. Um, we will come back and remember the um, respiratory control after we've finished the synthesis and oxidation of fatty acids. That'll happen, as I said, next week. For right now, I want to focus our attention on how it is that we make the um, uh, uh, glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids and other lipids for our membranes. Okay? So I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. And I go through it kind of quickly uh, mostly because I'm not asking you to memorize specific structures here. I'm asking you to, to learn some general things. And these are very general things about how these pathways operate. OK, okay. so um, I'll remind you that glycerophospholipids are one type of lipid that we find in our lipid bilayers. Sphingolipid is a second. Cholesterol is a third. Okay? We also know there are proteins in our lipid bilayers as well. Phosphatidic acid is a molecule that I referred to um, earlier. Phosphatidic acid, I'll remind you, has a glycerol backbone. It has two fatty acids attached to it. And it has a uh, phosphate attached to it. So it differs from a fat in that a fat, and here's the final phosphatidic acid down here on the, on the lower right, okay? it differs from a fat in that it has this phosphate instead of a third fatty acid. Okay? Phosphatidic acid is a precursor of the glycerophospholipids. It's also a precursor of fat. So cells actually make phosphatidic acid en route to making fat. So they'll make this compound. Then they will pull the phosphate off and replace it with a fatty acid. And bingo, they've made fat. If they're making a glycerophospholipid, instead of pulling the phosphate off, what they will do is they will attach something to that phosphate. Okay? That creates what we call phosphatidyl compounds. So we talked earlier about phosphatidyl serine, phosphatidyl ethanolamine. So phosphatidyl serine would occur, would, would be made by putting a serine onto this phosphate at the end. Phosphatidyl ethanolamine, similarly we put ethanolamine out here. Quite a wide variety of things that we could put on that. Now the reason we make, the phos we make um, molecules like this is that they are essential for the structure of the lipid bilayer. Right? These things made in the way that I'm describing to you will self-assemble into a bilayer. So there's nothing extra that the cell has to do to make a simple bilayer. Now cells do mix and match things and so forth there, so that's uh, a simplification. But nonetheless, this basic structure is important for cells to be able to make a, a bilayer. Here's the, yes? I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, you the yes. So the I, I said they would self-assemble into the bilayer. And her question is, are they more like cholesterol in the bilayer? These are glycerophospholipids. So cholesterol is a separate molecule, right? So these will self-assemble into a bilayer. If you take cholesterol, it will not self-assemble into a bilayer. Okay. So glycerophospholipids and sphingolipids will self-assemble into a bilayer. If I mix cholesterol with that, the cholesterol will end up in the bilayer, but cholesterol by itself will not make a bilayer. Yeah, good question. OK, so phosphatidic acid, uh, as I said, was a precursor of fat. Here's the phosphatidic acid that we had. Here is the removal of that phosphate, making something called diacylglycerol. Where have you seen diacylglycerol before? Signaling last term, right? It was one of the signaling molecules in the membrane. So diacylglycerol could be a, sin a signaling molecule. It's generally not made this way in route to be being a signaling molecule. Instead, it, that, that signaling molecule, diacylglycerol, is made by the way we talked about last time from IP3, or P I'm sorry, PIP2 to make IP3. Um, 
Diisoglycerol uh, made in this way is converted into fat very easily by simply putting uh, a fatty acid in an, in an ester form at position number three. And we've done that, we've made a fat. Now, fat is something that's only found in um, specialized cells called adipocytes. Okay? So our normal cell, our, our, our cells of our skin and so forth aren't repositories of fat. We have specialized cells called adipocytes that are for the storage of fat, and that's where we find those fat molecules. All right, so here's just some sample reactions that you can see uh, to make some of the glycerophospholipids. This one is, uh, that you see on the screen is one that's made um, as an intermediate en route to making other glycerophospholipids. Okay? Now, I want you to look at this. This is phosphatidic acid, and I'm pulling off the phosphate, and I'm replacing it with something called CDP diacylglycerol. So here's, this, here's the CDP part of it. It includes both of those phosphates, the blue and the red. That's the CDP part of the molecule. And there's the diacylglycerol part of the molecule in black. As I said, this is an intermediate en route to making many of the glycerophospholipids. Why do you suppose cells are making something like this as an intermediate? Activated intermediate. Okay, very good. You saw UDP glucose as an activated intermediate en route to making glycogen. And that activated intermediate was something that had high energy, and it used the energy of, that, of itself to donate a part of itself to something else. This guy is using the high energy of this bond to donate this black part onto something else, like a serine or an ethanolamine, to make that bond. So making that bond requires some energy. And that energy comes from the energy inherent to this molecule right here. OK. Now, we can um, see, for example, uh, the addition of inositol. OK, so inositol plus CDP diisoglycerol gives us phosphatidyl inositol and CMP. Notice that. One of the phosphates stayed behind, the one in red, and the other phosphate came off with this guy. So in essence, to get to this place, let me show you what we had to do. We had to go from CTP, a triphosphate, to CDP, a diphosphate. That tells you energy was put into this molecule because a phosphate was cleaved and getting it to that point. And then additional energy was donated to make the final molecule here of phosphatidylinositol and CMP. So basically, we've cleaved two phosphates in order to make this guy right here. The other thing I'll point out to you about this that's interesting is now we have a role for all of the nucleotides in making uh, biological compounds. All right? We had UDP glucose needed to make glycogen. We have CDP diisoglycerol used to make the glycerophospholipids. We have ATP used for general energy purposes. And I've told you that we use GTP as a way of making proteins. All four nucleotides are intimately connected to metabolism. And that turns out to be really, really cool because the synthesis of DNA requires energy, it requires nucleotides, and it requires all these compounds that are being made with them. It requires proteins. Ideally, for many cells, it requires glycogen. It certainly requires glycerophospholipids. Okay? If we don't have enough nucleotides, we won't have enough of these compounds that we need to go forward. So therefore, the cell won't divide. And if we have plenty of these compounds, and plenty of the energy, plenty of the, the nucleotides to make these compounds, then the cell does have enough energy, and it will be able to divide. Pretty cool. All right? So measures of the nucleotides really give cells a very good measure of their energy assessment and their, energy abil their abilities to use that energy going forward. OK, questions about that? Passive group today. 
Okay. Um, we don't need to worry about that. Okay, now, there are many ways of making the glycerophospholipids, and I show you this not to give you a way of memorizing all of those ways, okay? So um, let me show you one, and, and I hope I don't confuse the picture in, in, in terms of doing this. I showed you how, excuse me, how I could activate the diacylglycerol and use that activated diacylglycerol to add to something else. This shows us that we can also activate the something else and add it to diacylglycerol. All right? So in this case, we're activating ethanolamine. We've got CDP ethanolamine, and we're adding to it diacylglycerol, and we end up with phosphatidyl ethanolamine. Now, I don't show this on the screen to say, okay, we've got to memorize this one goes this way and the other one goes the other way. That's not the important thing here. The important thing is that we have two ways of making glycerol phospholipids, either activating the diacylglycerol or activating the thing that gets put on to diacylglycerol. And we're not going to worry about which one works which way. Okay? So that's why metabolism of glycerol phospholipids is actually pretty simple from our perspective. Make sense? Yes, Omar. Okay, so his question is, can I go over the second way to make glycerol phospholipids? And that's actually right here. All right. So in this, so let's say I wanted to make phosphatidyl ethanolamine. Okay, I've already shown you that I could activate diacylglycerol, and activate and, and take that CDP diacylglycerol and add it to something else. I showed you inositol, but let's imagine I'm adding it to ethanolamine. The energy in the, in the CDP diacylglycerol will allow the diacylglycerol to be added to ethanolamine. In this case, I'm saying, well, what if I flip it? What if I activate the ethanolamine and use the energy of this molecule to add it to diacylglycerol? Just flipping the whole process. Okay? This simply shows us that, yes, I can do that as well. So I can act in each case, I had to have an activated intermediate. In one case, the activated intermediate involved diacylglycerol. In the other case, the activated intermediate involved the thing that was being added to diacylglycerol. But in both cases, you see I came out with a CMP, and I came out with a diacylglycerol phosphate linked to the molecule that I've added. Yes, sir? What is the source of the phosphatidic acid? Phosphatidic acid. <laughs> so I've already made phosphatidic acid, right? So remember, I can make phosphatidic acid by starting with glycerol, fatty acids, and, and ATP to put the phosphate on. Okay. Okay. That is summarized, summarizing how we make phos um, phosphatidyl compounds. All right. All right. Sphingolipids are made in um, a little bit different fashion because they are different molecules, even if they do resemble the glycerol phospholipids. Okay? Sphingolipids look like they come from this molecule on the screen, which is where they get their name. In fact, they don't come directly from this compound, but we sort of forget that. All right? We sort of forget that. They're related to sphingosine. If you know that, that's good enough. All right? Well, how is it that we make the glycerol I'm sorry, we make the sphingolipids? It turns out we make them from two things laying around the cell that are very abundant. One is a fatty acid, palmitic acid. In this case, it's linked to uh, CoA to make palmitoyl CoA. And the other is the amino acid serine. If we do that, we create something called a ceramid. Okay? I'm sorry, we, we haven't created the ceramid yet, but we've, we've put these together into making a, the first of the sphingolipids. I'm not asking you to memorize these names. I will ask you to know what a ceramid is, and I'll tell you what that is in a second. So the, the synthesis of sphingolipids requires as precursors palmitoyl coa and the amino acid serine. Those get manipulated in a couple of reactions all right, to produce something called a ceramid. What is a ceramid? Okay? If we look right here, this thing called dihydrosphingosine. By the way, you'll notice there's nothing in here called sphingosine. So sphingosine is not an intermediate, but it looks like one of the intermediates. Okay. 
If we look right here, we see that up at this end of the molecule, okay, right here, we see that a fatty acid is getting attached. If I take this product of palmito oil, CoA, and serine, and I attach a single fatty acid to it, I create a molecule called a ceramid. And you'll notice I'm calling it a ceramid because there are many ceramids. How do they differ from each other? By the composition of the fatty acid. Depends on which fatty acid I put onto it, but all of the molecules that have a fatty acid on them will be categorized as a ceramid. So ceramids are a collection of sphingolipids, a group of sphingolipids. Okay. If I take that ceramid, okay, and add various things to it, I can make sphingomyelin. Okay. How do I make sphingomyelin? All right. Well, I uh, put on a phosphate, and interestingly, look where that phosphate comes from. It comes from a glycerophospholipid. The phosphate comes from phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine, interestingly enough, is a neurotransmitter, meaning it's used in the transmission of information in nerve cells. And look what the product is, sphingomyelin, a molecule that's very abundant in nerve cells. So it's using, as its phosphate source, something that's going to be important for a nerve cell, phosphatidylcholine, to make membranes for a nerve cell. A ceramid, if it goes the other direction, can become a cerebroside. And a cerebroside, you remember, I hope, is a sphingolipid that has a simple sugar attached to it, in this case, glucose. Notice how the glucose is put on with another activated intermediate. If I take and I put additional sugars onto that glucose, I make a more complicated, more complex sphingolipid. The category of these are known as gangliosides. So in each case, ceramids are a category or class of sphingolipids. Cerebrosides are a class of sphingolipids. And gangliosides are a class of sphingolipids. And their class is because they all differ in the composition of the fatty acid. They may differ in the composition of the simple sugar, and they will definitely differ in the composition of the complex uh, carbohydrate out there as well. OK, notice adding those sugars requires activatedness. And if I said, you're adding an activated sugar, what would you think would be attached to it? A nucleotide of some sort. Use the UDP, but it could be GDP as well. Yes? Can you only make a ganglioside from a cerebroside? The answer is basically yes. Okay? Um, that is that you need to have something on there to get started before you add to that. Now the addition of and, this, and the breakdown of the addition of sugars to make gangliosides and the breakdown of gangliosides is the source of many genetic diseases. And the genetic diseases frequently result in uh, problems neurologically. In many cases, they may result in retardation due to difficulties in being able to properly make things for the, the nerve tissue. One of these is something called Tay-Sachs disease. Okay? And Tay-Sachs disease, well, actually, let me back up to that. Uh, Tay-Sachs disease is a disease that has many different manifestations. You can have Tay-Sachs disease uh, that manifests at birth, that manifests later in life, uh, in teenage years, or even manifests uh, as an adult, the ones that manifest at birth are the most severe and may uh, likely result in early, very early death. Um, this shows um, a, um, a gangliosite that is um, uh, common in um, uh, neural membranes. And if we look at, I thought I had the me metabolic pathway here, but I guess I don't. Uh, if we look at defects in breaking this guy down, we will um, 
end up with accumulation of this in membranes, and the accumulation is just as bad as a deficiency. Accumulation results in abnormal nerve cells and cause problems. Interestingly, uh, as I said, there are many uh, genetic defects in uh, the metabolism of gangliosides because all those different, there are many different enzymes involved in putting individual sugars on, and there are many, many different sugars that are put onto uh, the glucose in gangliosides, and breaking them down. So both ways we end up with that. As I said, one of the manifestations of that is Tay-Sachs disease, and that's a very uh, debilitating genetic disorder. This is, the de this is the reaction that's deficient in Tay-Sachs disease. It's unable to break down the uh, N-acetyl galactose off of this guy. And again, I'm not asking you to memorize the structure, so don't sweat this. But uh, you can see that this one simple reaction here in the breakdown of a gangliocyte is, um, has some very severe uh, um, uh, manifestations, as I said. Okay. Um, questions about that? Yes, sir. Is the synthesis of the, fat, of the uh, uh, glycerophospholipids and, and of these other lipids always going on? Um, the, if we think about the, the um, uh, different needs of cells, if they're rapidly dividing cells, we're going to have more synthesis of these going on. If they're not at rapidly dividing cells, then they're probably not going to have very much of those going on. So I can't give you one rule. It's really going to depend a lot on, the, on the, the, what the, the needs of the cell are. There will be some replacement that will be going on with time, yes. So it's, but I'm saying you're going to have high versus low, okay? High synthesis versus low synthesis. Okay. Cholesterol. Now, cholesterol turns out to be the most interesting of these with respect to um, its properties and with respect to its synthesis. I am going to uh, go through its synthesis here and talk a little bit about um, its properties. And um, I... Um, We'll also skip over uh, some of the regulation of that. I'll talk about the regulation on Monday. But I do want to get into some of the transport, if I can, of this, because it's really fascinating what happens with cholesterol in the body. Um, as I've told some of you, uh, cholesterol is a molecule we don't know really that much about, even though we've been studying it for well over 100 years. There have been five Nobel Prizes given for studying cholesterol, and there's still a lot about cholesterol that we don't know. Okay? Cholesterol is made in a very interesting, simple set of reactions. What you see on the screen is the structure of cholesterol. And what you also see is the precursor molecule for cholesterol. Cholesterol is made from, completely from, acetyl-CoA. Here's the acetyl part of acetyl-CoA. We see the carbonyl carbon shown in pink. We see the uh, methyl carbon shown in blue, and we see where all those carbons end up in this molecule. It takes a lot of acetyl-CoA's to make cholesterol. Okay? But every carbon in that cholesterol molecule came from one of these carbons in acetyl-CoA. We're going to see how that happens. What you see on the screen is a synthetic pathway involved in making cholesterol. Okay? Now we're going to talk more about this reaction later, but I'm showing you this on the screen because it's necessary to see this to understand the synthesis of cholesterol. Okay? Here's something called acetoacetyl-CoA. Acetoacetyl-CoA is made very simply. It's made by putting together two acetyl-CoA's. You split out a CoA and you get acetoacetyl-CoA. Our body makes this all the time, and it makes it for a variety of reasons. It may make it for the synthesis of cholesterol. It may make it for the synthesis of some compounds we'll talk about later called ketone bodies. But nonetheless, acetoacetyl-CoA comes from two acetyl-CoA's. And as I said, we'll see this reaction again later. Acetoacetyl-CoA, if I combine it with a third acetyl-CoA, makes something called 3 hydroxy 3-methylglutaryl-CoA, or something you're more likely to remember as HMG-CoA. Okay? HMG-CoA. All right. Now, if I take that HMG-CoA and I convert it into this molecule called mevalonate, 
I use an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. That's a very important enzyme name, so I'm going to repeat it. HMG-CoA reductase. By going through the pathway up into green using that enzyme, this 6-carbon HMG-CoA is targeted for the synthesis of cholesterol. This is, going upwards into green, a committed step in making cholesterol. If, on the other hand, this HMG-CoA runs through the bottom reaction that we'll talk about later, okay, it makes ketone bodies. So HMG-CoA is a branch point in the synthesis of cholesterol or ketone bodies. We're going to follow the cholesterol path right now. Now, I told you HMG-CoA reductase, that enzyme, is very important. And the reason it's very important is that it's the primary regulated enzyme in the synthesis of cholesterol. The primary regulated enzyme in the synthesis of cholesterol. How is it regulated? Feedback inhibition. What's going to inhibit it, folks? Cholesterol. That's how feedback inhibition works. The product of the pathway inhibits the first important enzyme in the pathway, and that first important enzyme in the pathway is HMG-CoA reductase. If everything's working well in your body, when you make too much cholesterol, this enzyme will shut down and you will quit synthesizing cholesterol. Okay? Now, that doesn't always work. That's some of the magic, or perhaps not magic. We think of magic associated with a positive thing. That's some of the problems with cholesterol as well. This enzyme, HMG-CoA reductase, is also the target of drugs that people take to reduce cholesterol. The drugs are called statins. Statins. And statins are competitive inhibitors of the enzyme. What do you suppose they look like? No, not cholesterol. A competitive inhibitor. How do competitive inhibitors work? They resemble the substrate. What's the substrate? So they're going to resemble HMG-CoA, right? That's what they're going to do. Statins have a structure similar to the structure of HMG-CoA. Statins are spelled S-T-A-T-I-N. There's a class of them, all related structures. These statins are given to people who have high cholesterol, who are unable to reduce their cholesterol levels by diet and other means. And they're very effective. They're very, very effective. Okay. Now, yes? Is this drug also used to inhibit ketones? It will have no effect on ketones because that's a different pathway. That's the bottom pathway. So it's inhibiting that top pathway, right? OK. Now, what I want to do is I want to take a minute and show you the pathway. The pathway looks like it's very hairy and complicated, but it's actually quite simple. It's simple to you, Ahern. It's not simple to me, right? OK. And by the way, you're not going to draw these structures. I think you should recognize, know what cholesterol looks like generally. And I think you should know something about how the carbons are moving here. You'll see how simple this is if we just follow it as carbons and don't worry about structures so much. Okay? We had a six carbon molecule, HMG-CoA, that got converted into mevalonate. All right? Mevalonate can be converted in a, in a set of reactions from a six carbon molecule into a five carbon molecule. And there are two five-carbon molecules called isoprenes that are used to make cholesterol. Okay? Yes? Isoprene is a five-carbon. It, 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 it consists of two different molecules okay, that contain five carbons that are the precursors 
of cholesterol. They're used to build and make cholesterol. And it's made, these are made from mevalonate. Yes. Okay. Now, um, what are the two molecules? Here's one. And by the way, again, we're not going to worry about the reactions. We're going from six carbons to five carbons. We see a decarboxylation happening. That's what's happening to the carbon. I want you to see that there's an ATP, there's an ATP, there's an ATP. We see that this is an energetically costly synthesis. So cells don't want to make too much cholesterol if they don't have to. And that's why feedback inhibition is important, the end product of the pathway, turning off the earlier ones. So we can stop the use of ATP if we don't need the cholesterol. And this mevalonate is being converted into one of the isoprenes. In this case, isopentanyl pyrophosphate. That's how I call it. I leave the three off. Isopentanyl pyrophosphate. That's one of the isoprenes. Isopentanyl pyrophosphate can be converted into the other isoprene very easily by an isomerization, and it's called dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate. These two five carbon intermediates go together to make cholesterol. Okay? Isopentanyl pyrophosphate, dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate, and yes, those names are important. You're not going to memorize the structures, but you should really have five carbons. You should definitely know they each have five carbons. Okay. How were they used, actually this is the bad figure, how were they used to make um, um, cholesterol? All right. Well, here's dimethyl allopyrophosphate. Here's isopentanyl pyrophosphate. I take one five carbon intermediate, I add it to another five carbon intermediate, and I've got a 10 carbon intermediate. The 10 carbon intermediate is known as geronyl pyrophosphate. I take the 10 carbon intermediate, and I add another 5 carbon intermediate, and I get a 15 carbon intermediate, known as farnesyl pyrophosphate. These are like building blocks. 5 plus 5 equals 10. 10 plus 5 equals 15. And farnesyl pyrophosphate, if I take two of those and combine them together, I end up with something called squalene that has 30 carbons. Very simple. Okay, so his question is, can you all, are, are five always added, or can you add 10 at a time, or otherwise? Um, there are other pathways besides the ones I'm showing here that can lead to other compounds like vitamin A and vitamin uh, C, I'm uh, sorry, vitamin E, all right, that may involve addition of other things. But for the synthesis of cholesterol, this ten, 5 plus 5 to make 10, 10 plus 5 to make 15 is critical. You do take two 15s to make a 30. Squalene is the, what I call the last of the linear intermediates. You see there are no rings here yet. This is a linear molecule. It's got a bunch of double bonds in it. But squalene is rearranged with those double bonds. Here's what squalene looks like. And if I start twisting these bonds around, it starts to look like what cholesterol is going to look like. I see the various swaps of electrons, the new bonds forming. And bang, I've got something that resembles cholesterol called lanosterol. Lanosterol is what I call the first cyclic intermediate. So I go from the, la the last linear to the first cyclic. Now, I doubt that any of you here memorized that structure of cholesterol from what I showed you earlier. But I'm sure you can recognize that this looks very much like cholesterol. All right. It would seem that we have to go just a little bit to get to cholesterol, and we would be there. But in fact, to go from here to cholesterol requires 19 more steps. Is he going to make us learn 19 more steps? <laughs> I mean, he's an idiot, right? <laughs> okay. When I was a graduate student studying metabolism, I had to learn all 19 of those steps. And I swore I'd make my students do that at some point. But 
I'm not going to make you learn that. Okay. All right. But 19 steps to go from lanosterol to cholesterol. Okay. Many of those steps require energy. So we've already seen to go from mevalonate to um, um, I'm sorry, to go from um, uh, yeah, mevalonate to uh, uh, isopentanyl pyrophosphate required three ATPs. We've already invested a fair amount of ATPs because that was to make one 5-carbon intermediate. We've got six of them in there. We've burned 18 ATPs just to get to squalene. We're going to burn more ATPs to finally get to cholesterol. The synthesis of cholesterol is very energetically demanding of cells. Cells want to be careful not to make too much or they're wasting energy. Okay? That's probably the way you're going to learn this. Lenosterol, 19 steps, cholesterol. Okay? Everybody now laughs. That's good. <laughs> Before that, I was a little nervous. But you see, they're not that different from each other. There's a double bond there. There's no double bond there. We lose um, a total of three carbons in the process of doing that. We gain a double bond here. Um, uh, we gain a methyl, we swap some methyl groups and so forth around. But it's not, a, it's not significantly different in appearance from lanosterol. Cholesterol is important for membranes. Cholesterol is important for two other things in the body. It's important for the synthesis of steroid hormones. Steroid hormones. These include sex hormones and other hormones that are very important in the body. Cholesterol is a precursor of them. Cholesterol is, is something we call um, a, um, uh, an isoprenoid because it's made from an isoprene. Okay. It is, oh, by the way, when I talk about the steroid hormones, something we can group in that category is vitamin D. Vitamin D acts in some cases like a hormone. And cholesterol is a precursor of vitamin D. So the hormones, including vitamin D, steroid hormones. Okay. The second thing that cholesterol is important for is the synthesis of bile acids. Bile acids turn out to be very important, as we'll, we'll describe next week, or uh, probably on Monday. Bile acids are important in the process of digestion. They help to emulsify fat in our digestive system because they act like detergents. And I'll show you how that happens next time. I'm not going to talk about it here. Bile salt, bile acid, same thing. So the salt is simply the, the salt form of an acid. Yes, bile salt, bile acid. I use the terms interchangeably. OK. That's pretty cool. All right. Um, questions about that? Yes. Was there a Oh, yeah, question. So when I add the dimethyl, pyro, dimethyl allopyrophosphate and the isopentyl pyrophosphate, can I substitute one for the other in the synthesis? The answer is no. But I'm not going to ask you to tell me which one goes in where and so forth. All right? I think you should know they are precursors and that they end up in squalene, which ends up in cholesterol. But I'm not going to ask you which one goes to which one and how many are in there. I think that's trivial. OK? I'm inclined to dive into the rest of the stuff. And we've got a few minutes to do it. but. I think I've covered a lot of material today. Do you guys get that sense? I'll make a deal with you. Question first. Yes. So the question is, do the statins resemble HMG-CoA or HMG-CoA reductase? What do competitive inhibitors look like, folks? Substrates. So which one's a substrate? HMG-CoA. So a competitive inhibitor would never resemble an enzyme. It, it couldn't do that. Right? Make sense? OK, so the deal, yeah. Shh, shh, shh. Say it again, I'm sorry. Yes? Oh, good question. So his question is, if I use statins, Will I have um, side, pro or side reactions or other problems associated with steroid hormones or uh, bile acids? Okay? Um, the answer is you might uh, to some extent. Okay? 
but you don't completely inhibit the synthesis of cholesterol. I want to emphasize that, okay? So we, we need cholesterol for various things. Now, you guys want out early. My deal in getting out early is if you will sing very loud, all right? Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll do two things. One is we will have an extra credit question on the exam, and two, we'll leave early. Is that a deal? Okay, this is an easy song to sing. It's about the synthesis of cholesterol to an easy tune to make a cholesterol. Some things that you can build with acetyl-CoAs are joined together partly thanks to thiolase. They come together, one, two, three, six carbons known as HMG, and you're on your way to make a cholesterol to synthesize a mevalonate in the cell. Reducing HMG CoA as well. The enzyme is a reductase and controlled in allosteric ways when the cell's impelled to make a cholesterol. The mevalonate made in metabolic schemes gets decarboxylated down to isoprenes. They're linked together willy nil to build a PP geranil in the cell's routines to make a cholesterol. A single step flex farnesils, but that's not all. The squalene rearranges to lanosterol. From that, there's 19 steps to go before the sterols apropos, which you must recall to make a cholesterol. The regulation of the scheme's complex in ways inhibited by feedback of the reductase. And statins mimic, so they say, the looks of HMG-CoA. So we sing their praise and not make cholesterol. One last announcement, and I'll let you go. I've had several questions about the highlights on the citric acid cycle, and the highlights say you have to memorize the structures of the molecules. That's inadvertent. You don't have to memorize those structures. I will take that out, okay? So thanks for those of you who have asked me. See you Monday.